Good evening, and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Adrienne Westmoreland, a family physician with Community Memorial Hospital Family Clinic in Cloquet, and I'm your host for tonight's program on diabetes, diagnosis, complications, and treatment. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Melissa Roby, family physician at Community Memorial Hospital Family Clinic, Dr. Sandy Stover, a family medicine physician and faculty member at the University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth campus, and Dr. Robert Schoberg, an endocrinologist with St. Luke's Endocrinology Associates. Our medical students answering the phone this evening are Bobby Livingood of Owatonna, Emily Osborne of ESCO, and Sarah Raya of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. The success of this program depends on you, the viewer. Please call in with your questions about diabetes and we'll do our best to address them. The telephone numbers for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. And now on to tonight's program. So while we wait for some questions, why don't we think about and talk to our viewers about what are some of the common things that might bring a patient to their family physician for them to be concerned about that they might have diabetes? Would you like to take that? Sure. So uh, we, as a primary care doctor, I definitely see a lot of patients who uh, are, might be concerned about diabetes or might be having some early symptoms. So one of the most common things people um, note with when they actually have a diagnosis of diabetes is rapid weight loss that might be intentional but more than they were expecting. People also come in a lot of times complaining that they're uh, um, much thirstier than usual or urinating much more than usual. Uh, sometimes people just feel unwell or they're struggling with recurrent infections. So I would say those are probably the most common things that I see. I have a lot of people who uh, are aware that there's diabetes in their family and so they may be a little bit more on the uh, kind of on the alert for something that might happen. So if there's a primary family member, a, a parent or a sibling who's got diabetes, if one is, uh, is carrying an extra pounds, that can be a risk factor. Uh, for women who have had gestational diabetes, they have a much higher risk later on of developing diabetes as an adult. So um, I had a 10 and a half pound baby, so technically I wasn't uh, uh, tested as diabetes, but even just having one, a baby over 10 pounds is considered a risk factor for developing diabetes at a future stage. And there's really two diabetes that we're talking about, type one diabetes and type two diabetes that we hear a lot about. Um, and I think the, you know, most of us adults who develop diabetes as an adult, it's usually type two diabetes. Um, and that has more of the risk factors associated with uh, carrying extra weight or uh, not being very active. Um, actually smoking itself is a risk factor for diabetes, but if you have diabetes and smoke, it's a higher risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So. Those are some of the things that I, I try to help people look at too as uh, ways they can help minimize the risk of developing it. It's probably, it's probably worth pointing out that many people with diabetes have no symptoms at all mm -hmm. as well. That's a good so point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so certain subgroups of people that you pointed out should be screened for diabetes even without symptoms as well. So right. Dr. Schubert, could you talk to us a little bit about epidemiology and what we see with regards to different populations in diabetes? Well, the overall uh, incidence of diabetes in this country is about 9%, which means about 23 million people in this country with diabetes. Um, it's more common in certain ethnic groups in this part of the country. It's particularly common in the Native American population, but also uh, in Hispanics and uh, blacks have a higher risk of diabetes. Uh, in 2017, we spent about uh, 240 billion with a B dollars on uh, taking care of folks with diabetes. That's about a quarter of our total health care dollars, so it's a huge public health problem. So our first question is here, and um, from Wisconsin, the big concern is what is adult onset diabetes? And would any of you be interested in taking that question and trying to describe to our viewers what actually is adult onset diabetes? Um, well, I think one thing to, to think about is what is diabetes itself, and and I, I think it, and you can correct me if I, if I, if I misspeak, but uh, our bodies use glucose in the cells to create energy to make things work, basically. And we eat food that helps us get glucose into the body, and it has to get into the cell and do its thing with the help of insulin. And so e you can have problems producing enough insulin, or you can have problems with resistance to how the insulin works, and there's a lot of other variations on that. Um, but those are the two kind of big categories of the way I think of it. And so trouble with insulin itself, making it, is usually a type 1 problem. Insulin resistance is usually a type 2 problem. 
And so we tend to develop type 2 diabetes at later ages, although we're seeing it in younger people than we did 30 years ago. So the term adult onset diabetes mm -hmm. doesn't really apply anymore. Um, we refer to it now as type 2 diabetes because it can come on at any age. So our next question is more concerning with regards to what levels are too high with regards to glucoses. So Dr. Ruby, would you mind taking what fasting glucoses kind of are and then what postprandial glucoses are and what we're seeing with regards to normal glucoses? Sure. So uh, glucose obviously has a range, and it depends sort of if you're fasting, meaning you haven't had anything to eat or eat in you know eight to twelve hours, or if you've just eaten. So when we talk about screening for and diagnosing diabetes, we like to look at the fasting blood sugar. Um, I'm trying to decide right now if it's 126 or 136. 126. Yeah. So 126 is the cutoff for fasting blood sugar, and then we look at another marker called hemoglobin A1C, which is sort of gives us an, a broader picture of what your blood sugar uh, has been over the last three months. And so that number, the cutoff for diagnosing diabetes is six and a half. And so um, we look at both of those numbers together to decide whether or not someone has a diagnosis of diabetes. And we can use those same numbers to get an idea of if someone has what we would consider pre-diabetes or a um, increased risk of developing diabetes over time. So we know that we can try to help those people make lifestyle changes at that time. Uh, before they actually develop diabetes. So uh, blood sugar definitely changes after we eat as well. So we um, expect people's blood sugars will be a little bit higher after they've eaten. Excellent. So Dr. Rev Dr. Shepard, we have a lot of questions with regards to medications and insulin in particular. And so I'm sure that we'll get more questions with regards to orals, but do you mind speaking on insulin for right now and just talking about how we decide when we put patients on insulin? where they should inject it, and also kind of how they decide that they have to go on insulin. Well, Dr. Stover referred to type 1 and type 2 diabetes and to the fact that folks with type 1 diabetes have high blood sugars because their body simply doesn't make insulin. So people with type 1 diabetes, therefore, need insulin. I mean, the, the treatment is to replace the missing hormone, which is insulin. Um, but the majority of people with diabetes, 90% of people with diabetes, have type 2 diabetes, and they most commonly can be treated with uh, oral agents. Um, the decision to use insulin depends on how high their blood sugar is. Um, you might need to start insulin right away if their blood sugar is quite high at the time of diagnosis, or if the blood sugar goes up uh, with time as they take more medications, they might need to take insulin then. Um, there's a whole gamut of different types of insulin that can be used, and typically when we start insulin, we start uh, with a, a simple regimen of one injection a day of insulin in type 2 diabetics and gradually build the dose up until we get the blood sugar down. That's excellent. So, so Dr. Stover, you mentioned that Diet and exercise are super important for diabetics. Are any of you familiar with the keto diet? We've got a couple of questions on whether this could be beneficial for patients with diabetes. Um, and I, I will say that there, um, overall, there are some benefits to the ketogenic diet to lose weight, which could help reduce some of the resistance of diabetes. But I, my personal opinion is that any diet that doesn't reflect a broad use of some of the healthy carbohydrates, uh, oranges, blueberries, um, other fruits and vegetables, uh, does m create a situation where we might not, might not get as rounded a diet for us. That is my, that is my opinion. I think um, the most sensible diet is, is fresh as much as possible, lean as much as possible, and con controlled amounts as much as possible. And um, that's probably I'll speak for myself, probably my biggest thing is, is enjoying that extra helping, um, which is something that we can all cut back. I think we also probably um, eat more bread um, than in American diet than we probably should. So, yeah. so speaking of carbohydrates, one of our questions is asking about carbohydrates and how to actually count them with regards to the insulin ratio. And I will be honest, I defer to my diabetic educators with regards to this. But the question is, is, could you explain the ratio between carbs you eat and the amount of insulin that you take and how this changes over time? I'm going to have to defer to you, Dr. Schoberg, because 
I would defer to my educators with regards to this. Well, the, uh, what the question is referring to is dosing insulin, the, the quick acting insulin you take with meals to keep your blood sugar from spiking after meals and determining that dose based on how much carbohydrate you eat. I think that's what they're asking. And that's something just like almost everything with diabetes, it's very individualized between different people. Um, many people use a carb ratio of what we call 15 grams, meaning they would take one unit for every 15 grams of carb. But that's not to say that's true for everyone. Um, there's a lot of trial and error involved in figuring out what that ratio is for different people. And as the question implied, it can change over time in individuals as well. Uh, with a significant amount of weight loss, your um, insulin requirements might go down, so the carb ratio might change from one unit to 10 grams to one unit to 15. So diabetes and insulin dosing frequently is a moving target, and that points to the importance of monitoring your blood sugar. Do you know how you're doing? So would one of you maybe speak to how often a diabetic could see their family physician to be doing the monitoring, as Dr. Sugar suggested? Absolutely, so we recommend that people, especially with new diabetes, come and see us at least every three months. So really trying to gain tight control as quickly as possible. So I like to see diabetic patients every three months. If we have people who have had diabetes for some time and we know that they're well controlled and they're stable on their medications, that I might space that out to every six months. But again, because diabetes uh, can change over time and affect so many different body systems, it's really important that we keep very close tabs on that. The other thing I would add about this conversation is really the importance of a whole team. So it's not really just your doctor who needs to be helping here. So we have an amazing you know, diabetes education team of nutritionists who are very well educated on diabetes and can really help you learn about the carbs you're getting in your diet and how to improve your food, how to take your medicine better, when to use insulin. They even help us adjust insulin because as Dr. Schober said, it's a, it's a moving target. Someone needs to be keeping an eye on that and the blood sugars and helping to really fine tune that to get people um, under good control without getting low blood sugars because that of course is a risk as well. Right. So speaking of whole body and how the diabetes affects us, so there's a question from Duluth that is asking with regards to peripheral neuropathy, what's its connection to diabetes and does it also have a connection to smoking? Hmm. Um, by the way, you shouldn't be smoking if you're <laughs> diabetic, nor should you probably smoke if you're not diabetic. But um, the thing that, that diabetes has a peripheral damage to the body in both small blood vessels and small nerves. And if you think about where they are, it's not just peripheral neuropathy, but there are certainly small vessels and nerves in the eye, in the kidneys, in the heart, uh, which is a big risk factor with diabetes. Um, you know, in terms of the peripheral neuropathy, it's a kind of a symptom that can start in the fingers and the toes and feel like either a light burning or a, a, a sometimes a dull sensation or an itching sensation, but it will slowly progress to involve more and more of the, uh, the particularly the feet, but it will also involve the hands. Um, I think you know the the way that it works is it's com it's more complex than just affecting the, the vascularity itself but it's a it's a relative to the changes that happen because of persistent high, bl high blood sugars and so controlling sugars helps but even people who are very well controlled with their diabetes may still develop some of the side effects of the disease of diabetes so because diabetes affects so many systems we often start patients on multiple medications not just medications to help control glucose and sugars but also other medications what are some of those medications that they might be started on? Well, the main issue that you're referring to, I think, is cardiovascular disease. Um, having diabetes uh, in men, it essentially doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease. In women, it's even more. It triples the risk of cardiovascular disease. So uh, when we're seeing someone with diabetes, we're not just treating their high blood sugar. We're doing everything we can to minimize their cardiovascular risk. So that's where some of these other medications come in, uh, specifically lowering cholesterol. Uh, the statin medications will decrease heart attack risk by 20% at least. Uh, controlling high blood pressure, and uh, there's some new blood pressure guidelines out there, but uh, most, many people with diabetes require two or even three medications to adequately control their blood pressure. Uh, baby aspirin a day is recommended for many folks with diabetes, so 
I already just talked about uh, starting four medications in folks with diabetes outside of their blood sugar medications. That's a lot so of medications sometimes for patients to take. Yep. One of our questions is actually regarding NSAIDs, so a medic medication that we might use for inflammation in a person. And so the question is, could an NSAID be blamed for elevated fasting glucose in a non-diabetic person? Anyone who wanna think, take a swing at that I one? I think that they might be thinking about blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, the kidneys themselves are a target uh, area that can be affected by diabetes, but even in people who don't have diabetes, if they take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or naproxen, one of those, the blood pressure itself can go up because of some effects on the kidney. So if you're a diabetic and you already have some kidney issues and you're taking some of those medications, there can be uh, an increase in the blood pressure that's even more um, likely to happen. And so I think that's an issue. I think there's also some issues in the stomach that definitely, if you are taking anti-inflammatories that irritate your stomach and you're diabetic, it, there's an increased risk of that happening. Um, I don't think it means you can never take them, but I think it means you do everything in balance to get the best benefit with the least amount of risk. So we have several more questions with regards to insulin, both how you take it, where you should inject it, whether you should inject in stomach or thighs, and also if you should waste any insulin prior to injecting. That's, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the, the wasting issue is dependent on whether you're using a needle or one of the newer pens. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think with the pens, there's no expectation of waste with that. You don't need to push anything out. Um, and, and you may want to answer to that, too, if, if there's any reason for it. Well, I think you do have to prime the pen every time you do it, but that involves injecting like two units through the pen. It's a pretty trivial amount. Um, as far as injection sites, I, th I think the most important thing about insulin injection sites is to not pick one spot two spots that are that big and just inject in those spots uh, because you'll end up getting a lot of scarring and hypertrophy or swelling of the uh, area under the skin there. So the main thing is to rotate, you know, arms, stomach, legs. Uh, if you inject in your legs or arms, that uh, insulin tends to get absorbed more quickly. So the meal time, quicker acting insulin, you might want to inject there. In the abdomen, you inject the longer acting insulin. But the main issue is to rotate your injection sites. And thinking about, of course, we keep pushing diet changes, right, and exercise. So in thinking about diet changes and things that patients might do, what do you suggest with regards to non-pasteurized milk and other types of milk, not thinking cow's milk, but goat's milk or other? Have any of you found anything in your practice with regards to that and how it might affect diabetes? I generally recommend avoiding milk. I mean, it's going to be an occasional drink like any other, you know, non-water beverage, but I really think that people should drink mostly water. So I, I don't recommend that people use alternative milks, but just try to avoid it altogether. I, I think, you know, milk is, has issues related to it, but I think for diabetes, one of the things that's most important is to avoid sugar. And so I, I really encourage people to look at anything where white sugar has been added to it and think about it as a treat for special and not something that should be in a regular diet, including pop. One can of pop, it, you know, it depends on which one you, you get, but one can of pop has about eight teaspoons of sugar in it. And if you wouldn't sit and eat eight teaspoons of sugar, but we tend to th don't, not think about it when we're drinking pop. And so just pop itself is something that people can, can think about cutting out altogether and then being really careful about when they add anything with white sugar. That's true for fruit juice too. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, a lot of people think of orange juice as being a healthy thing, but it can really spike your blood sugar, has a lot of sugar in it. So mm -hmm. any sugar sweetened beverage it I sure would can. avoid. Yep. I'm gonna really direct you now, unfortunately, Dr. Schoberg, and I'm going to pimp you here on some biochem because one of our uh -oh. um, listener or one of our viewers from Virginia wants to know the connection between consuming artificial sugars like in pops and fruit juices and insulin production in the body. I'm going to spare both of y'all that biochem. Well, gee, I'm not aware that artificial sweeteners uh, affect insulin production in any way. Um, they do not acutely raise your blood sugar. Uh, but the problem with artificial sweeteners uh, and, uh, that's come out recently is it tends to affect your appetite. So folks that have artificial sweeteners change their sensation of taste because they're 
exposed to this sweet sensation all the time, and that causes them to eat more. So it, artificial sweeteners are better than sugar-sweetened beverages, but they are not good for you in terms of uh, your weight control. So it affects your appetite. I think there's some, some things I've read, too, that it may um, create some inflammation in the colon, uh, which may change how we absorb things. So if you take something that creates or has the potential to increase absorption, you actually pull in more calories than you think you might be otherwise. Um, and so it, it, it comes back to that, you know, probably what my grandmother did more than, than uh, a subsequent generations in our family, but eating fresh, eating lean, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to avoid the processed and, and sugar added foods. Dr. Shiver, that's an interesting comment that you make there because one of our viewers wants to know about historically how they controlled diabetes prior to the development of insulin. And I can't speak to that historical fact. I have a, my grandfather's brother died at age seven because he was diabetic and he died the year before insulin was made. It was, was, was created as something that could be injected and so it's something that was a family lore. Um, well, it, uh, your question a few minutes ago about the keto diet actually applies to this because essentially that's how folks with type 1 diabetes were mm -hmm. treated with something equivalent to a keto diet very low carb diet and by doing that they might extend their lifespan from weeks to months I mean it wasn't I mean a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes before 1921 when insulin was started was essentially a death sentence mm -hmm. so it was treated with diet very poorly and type 2 diabetes used to be much more rare, so there wasn't um, such a, a need. I mean, the food system in America has really um, caused a lot of, of the diabetes that we're seeing now. With regards to that and the changes that we've seen, so one of our viewers wants to know with regards to weight gain and insulin. And so you mentioned earlier that um, you might have a patient that presents with weight loss mm -hmm. when they come to the clinic. but what do you see with regards to weight gain and using insulin in your patients? I do see that a lot of times when people are started on insulin that they will gain some weight and they're generally not very happy about that. Right. Well, um, I mean, the reason why folks with diabetes lose weight is because their blood sugar is high enough that it gets filtered out into the urine. So they're losing sugar and calories out in the urine. So if you prevent that by giving folks insulin, they aren't losing those calories in the urine anymore and therefore they gain weight. There, there may be some effect of insulin on the appetite as well though. Um, so the two most common side effects of insulin are low blood sugar and weight gain. We see so yeah. commonly with our patients with regards to things that we need to do um, with regards to all these changes that we've had and you know medications and stuff that we've had. We're wrapping up our program now and I really appreciate all of you being here and so I want to thank all of you for coming and Dr. Melissa Roby, Dr. Sandy Stover, and Dr. Robert Schoberg for being here and helping us with the, regards to all of these difficult questions that we have with regards to diabetes and the changes that can happen. We also want to thank our medical student home volunteers, Bobby Livingood, Sarah Osborne, and Sarah Rajala. Um, please join Dr. Ray Christensen next week for a program on ENT problems. When we look at medical conditions involving the ear, nose, and throat, thank you for watching. Good night.